This edition of Computer Club Lesson is recorded on March 23rd, 2015. Enjoy! Hello, welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. Okay, so let's uh, get started here. There's a lot to talk about today, but and I'm gonna I'm gonna have to rush through it a little bit. But there, um, you'll have the video and you'll have a lesson on it uh, when I get up to it tomorrow or, or Wednesday. So today, what I want to talk about is spring cleaning. Boo ha! It's spring. <laughs> well, it, well, it is. Well, you hired somebody uh, from that. I'm not, I'm not lying to you, it's spring. A couple days ago, spring happened. But um, it's as, you know, you're, you're going to do your spring cleaning anyway, maybe. Um, so this is a good opportunity to talk about spring cleaning on your computer. And um, there are some things that you can do um, to help your computer run a little faster, get all the cruft off of it. Um, programs you, you maybe thought you might like to have and well that's junk let's get rid of it but you put it off and put it off so we'll go through the processes of uh, getting things on and off your computer that you can uh, it's going to run a little better for you uh, hopefully hopefully Windows is such a, um, a messed up piece of stuff um, that for now, the first thing that we should look at is disk cleanup. You all have it on your computers, disk cleanup. And the way to get to it is to go into your programs and under accessories, you will find a folder called system tools. And if you click on System Tools, you'll find Disk Cleanup there. Click on that. And after a couple of minutes, because it takes a couple of minutes to start Disk Cleanup, what Disk Cleanup is doing uh, in the first few minutes is it's going through your computer and looking at all of the temporary files, the downloaded files. It's going through your whole hard drive to find what, what you might be able to get rid of to help your computer run a little faster. And once this window eventually comes up, the disk cleanup window for C drive, uh, you'll find all of the entries that disk cleanup can do something about. Um, downloaded programs. A lot of people um, just download programs, download programs in their download folder, and there they sit. Um, no one ever bothers to go back into the download folder and delete them once you've, uh, once you've downloaded them. You know, maybe you sh you should think about deleting them, unless you really want the program to save and have because it's a good one. I would say put it off in a folder called Keep Me. Okay, uh, but uh, download downloaded programs like if you download malware bytes, the download will be in the downloads folder. Um, malware bytes is constantly updating itself, so you don't need to download it again. It can be gotten rid of. Doesn't that get rid of malware bytes then? No, yeah. no, it's just the download. The original, it, download. the original download and then you execute the download and it loads onto your computer. That's why I say the downloads originally are just an executable file that loads everything onto your computer. All right? Um, so you can get rid of downloaded programs Temporary internet files. If uh, a lot of you are using CCleaner, yeah. it yeah. does that all by itself. Yeah. Okay, but in this case, uh, I I keep a year's worth of temporary internet files on my computer. It, every yeah, every 366 <laughs> days, it cleans out one day's worth. So I've got 365 days worth. 
Uh, but you can see here, uh, there's 43 megabytes worth of, uh, of uh, temporary internet files. And remember what we talked about temporary internet files, what they are? Is they are the resources that your browser downloads from the internet, graphics, text that doesn't change, titles, all of that get downloaded into the uh, temporary internet files because it's faster for the computer to go and check those and bring those resources to the web page than it is to download them. It's 10 times faster. So it gives you that impression that your, your web browser is working really snappy, but in fact, it's going to the hard drive to see if there's anything that it can load first from the website you're going to, like a graphic. Okay, so that's what those are all about. Uh, if you save pages for offline viewing later, like you can do that. You can save a page for offline viewing if, if, it's, a, if it's a long story or a long article. Rather than keep downloading it, you save it for, for offline use later and it will be here. The recycle bin. The recycle bin, you know that if you put something in the recycle bin, if you haven't manually checked, empty the recycle bin on exit, it keeps stuff there. So if you put something in the recycle bin, it stays there until you actually manually go to the recycle bin and say, empty me. There is a checkbox in the recycle bin to say, empty me on exit. So it will empty the recycle bin on exit. Do you want to do that? Um, I would say no. It's too easy to put something in the recycle bin and decide two days from now I need it. And it's gone. It's gone. And so, maybe before you look at having the recycle bin emptied with this cleaner, go into the recycle bin and have a look and see what's there. Maybe there is something you want to keep. Put that into a file called Keep Me. <coughs> and you'll notice that as I'm going down this list, some of them are checked off by default and others are not. Um, in the recycle bin, if you want to empty that, you would put a check mark beside it so that when disk cleanup does its work, it will go to the recycle bin and empty it. The rest of it is log files, temporary files. Uh, there are temporary, there's on this computer, and it's not that old a load of Windows, there's already uh, one gig of temporary files on this computer. Now, Temporary files, what are they? When you load a program, sometimes the program you're loading has to have a place to put the files so that it can load them one at a time onto your computer to make, to make the, the, the load happen. It has to unbundle the original download and then puts the files somewhere temporarily where it can get at them to load them on your computer. It doesn't do it all in memory, it does it from the hard drive. That's where temporary files are coming from. As well as some forms of malware will load themselves into the temporary files folder and work from there. But as a general rule, if a file is in a temporary folder, your computer does not need it to work. It was put there to help load a program or it was put there temporarily when a program was looking for a place to put um, its working files. Um, something like Photoshop. As you're manipulating a picture in Photoshop, it's making temporary files of what you've done so it can go back to them if you ever want to undo what you did. It needs that temporary file to go back to, to say, okay, I can undo you because the old version is in temporary files. 
so you often as not you can find a lot of stuff in uh, temporary files. The rest of them uh, really is just having to do with error reports that the computer generates internally if you ever want to go and look at them. I can't think of a single reason why you would, but they are there. <coughs> Once you've decided what files you want to um, get rid of, then you click on the clean up system files button and away it will go. Sometimes it can take as much as an hour, but usually takes somewhere on the order of between 10 and 25 minutes for that to work. So, question. yes, question. What is CCleaner? Okay, we'll, co we'll come to CCleaner because it's part of the lesson a little later. All right, we will talk about CCleaner in a little bit because it's going to be part of this lesson. Have you checked off every little box? I could, but in this case, I only checked where the biggest, uh, the, the largest amount of data was that the computer doesn't need to work with. Yeah, and it's here. Temporary files, 1.9 gigs. That's a lot. That's a lot. So you then you would say, okay, and uh, allow it to do its work. I'm not going to do that because the computer will lock up. <laughs> it's old. Yeah. Okay. Further into the lesson, um, the first thing you should really do before you go, go through all of this is make sure that you have the latest updates for your computer. So if you're going to take an afternoon to do some spring cleaning, the first thing you do is go to Windows Updates, manually force it to update, and if there are updates, install them. Where's Windows Update? Windows Update is also from the Start menu. Click on All Programs, and it will be an entry under All Programs, Windows Update. Now, ordinarily, Windows updates happen once a week. For sure, they happen the second Tuesday of every month. They're pushed at you. Um, but if you're going to sit down and do this, do Windows Update first before you start. That way you've got all the updates. And by the way, updates make temporary files when they load themselves. So that's another place where you're going to get rid of the temporary files. They're from Windows updates. And so that's the first thing to look at is do your Windows update before you start. Now, there's uh, references into this lesson about Mac, but we're not dealing with Mac right now, so we're not going to do that. Um, if you have your computer set to only install updates when I say so, in other words, manually click on Windows Update, go get the updates and look at them, and then decide do you want them or not, that's okay for you XP users. Sorry, you're not getting updates. Don't worry about it. But this may help your computer run just a little bit better because it's not rummaging through these files all the time. The other thing that you can do is you can delete your browser histories and cookies. I've talked about this before, whether it's a good idea. It all depends on how you use your computer. If you delete all of the cookies on your computer every time you use it, every time you go back to a website you visit very, very often, and you've, you've got a login that you've saved and all of that, the, co the cookies say, okay, I know who you are. We'll pre-populate all of this stuff so that when you go to uh, CanadianTire.ca, it doesn't ask you, do you want to view me in English or French? The cookies say, oh, you clicked on English before. So it goes right to the English page. That's what a cookie does, as well as 
um, looking at how you want to be logged in. The history is the same thing. Um, it's looking at your browser history. Um, and the browser history is part of this Internet Explorer temporary files thing we've talked about. The browser history sort of connects with all of the resources that are in Internet Explorer temp files, where the graphics are, where the unchanging text is, stuff like that. So once you take away the history, then if you go back to that web page, it has to be downloaded completely again. And that's a little slower than having the computer check its hard drive for resources you already have. Question? Yes, question. Can you then just go and choose what cookies you get rid of? The cookies uh, folder is huge. Yeah, I was going to say mine's pages long. Yeah, exactly so. Don't mean anything to yeah. me you, you could, but it's pages long. It would take you days to go through them all. And so you either take them all or leave them all. It's just that simple. Take them all out or leave them all in. That's what C Cleaner does. If, if you just go on tools, doesn't that bring that page down? What to um, your history and your cookies? And yeah, there's yeah, yeah, there there yeah, there is um, yeah, there there are there are two ways to do it. There are two ways to get at your cookies and your history and delete them. The first way is to go into your control panel and under Internet Options. Okay, Internet Options. This is exactly the same panel that you would get to from the Internet Explorer toolbar yes. when you click on Internet Options there. So without having to open Internet Explorer, you can get at all these options from Internet Options in the control panel. The other good thing about that is that if Internet Explorer is misbehaving, um, you can reset it as you would from Internet Explorer toolbar. You can reset it from Internet Options. So you don't have to try and get it open. It's crashing, it's buggy, something's really, really wrong. You can reset it from here under the Advanced tab you'll look and see reset. And that resets Internet Explorer back to factory. Okay, so if it's got some some cruft in it somewhere that can be deleted just simply by resetting it, that's the way to do it. And often as not, you can get Internet Explorer back under control. Pardon me, would you repeat that once more? I've got IE hijacked. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if okay, if, if you've got if if your Internet Explorer has been hijacked, you've got more problems than inter than the Internet properties can take care of on its own. It can take care of a lot of them. Sometimes it can clear out a hijack if it's if it's something simple, but often as not, if your Internet Explorer has been hijacked, like uh, from Ask. You've got the Ask toolbar, okay? I didn't do that, okay, but I've got yeah. the Bikini Land. Okay, the yes, that, yes, and then you have to remove that for, with uh, under Programs and Features. There's a removal; uh, it can I be removed that, there. I, I went through; I removed it that way, but now it's hidden itself, and I can't find it. Well, by resetting Internet Explorer after you've remove Bikini Land, sometimes you can get it back under control again, just on a simple reset from the advanced panel. The other thing that you'll want to do is you'll want to go to the general panel and look at where uh, the Internet Explorer is, is pointing to on startup. In this case, I've got it pointing to Google. Okay, so if you had to change that, you would highlight the entry with your mouse and just start typing. Google.com, and it changes, hit, hit the apply button, and you might be out of trouble. You might be. 
But we'll look at that in, a, in another couple of minutes. There are some other things that we can look at in there. I just wanted to, to uh, Internet Explorer. So as, you, as I've said, you can get at the Internet options from the Internet Explorer toolbar. You click on Tools and the bottom entry is Internet Options. It's ex exactly the same panel. Exactly. Yes, question? Yeah, I got one, Bob. Uh, I got uh, Chrome and Internet Explorer. So if I delete them off of the Chrome, I still got to go to Internet Explorer. Yes, yes. Um, okay, I'll come back to you in a minute. What was your question? Okay, the check marks that come, the boxes that are already checked off when that page comes up. Yes. They're all okay to be just Yes. If, if for some reason they did get changed, they will be changed back to the factory settings. So some check boxes may appear and some may disappear, but it will be set back to factory. Okay. Um, while we're at it, uh, we may as well talk about the Chrome browser and how to uh, clean that up. What you want to do is, uh, I'm in the Chrome browser now, so up in the top right corner is your three little bars there where you get to the settings of the Chrome browser and you go down to settings and click on that. Now where the real problems might lie in the Chrome browser being taken over by something is in the extensions. So if you click on extensions Does that show up as EXE? No. It's written out? Extensions, yes. Um, you may find a whole list of stuff here from shopping sites and they will take over your browser and when you click on something in Google another page will pop open saying you want to shop here? Want to buy me? Buy me? Buy me? That's where they're coming from, from the extensions page. And you can just simply, if you find an extension that's there that you don't know about, just click on the trash can beside it and make it go away. I never ever use Chrome. Will I still have that? The, the Chrome icon keeps turning up even though yeah. I'm deleting it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it never goes away. It never goes away. Uh, that's, um, that's Google and Microsoft trying to be helpful. Oh. <laughs> They're just trying to be helpful and they will bother you with this stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. I I recommend. I highly recommend Chrome for everybody. Yeah. So I wouldn't have to go and clean Internet Explorer. Uh, you might have to because these things, when they come into your computer, look for all of the browsers that you have and make changes to all of them. Sometimes. So uh, we'll come to that in a minute. But the other the other thing that you can do here is that you can uh, under this entry on startup. If you click on set pages, if you've got the ask toolbar that got onto your computer somehow or some other uh, or it, it's, it's uh, when you click on Chrome it's coming up uh, as, as ask or, or some other um, web, website web director beside, other than Google, this is where you'll change it because on the startup pages, if I hover over Google, you'll see that it hovers with an X. If that was Ask, you can remove it by simply clicking the X. Okay? Then you would type in, add a new page, type in Google.com, and you're good. The page will open as Google.com rather than Ask, which is a huge pain in the bum. Okay, that's, that's a way to, to, uh, to clean it up. Um, down here, um, when you open a new tab, click on that one. Uh, in my case, um, I use a blank tab. I don't use anything, but if you wanted a new Google search page on a new tab, you would enter Google in here. If it came up with something else like the ask, well, then you can remove it as well. But I like to have a blank page. And then the other thing that you need to do, 
when you're in uh, Chrome settings, it, if you find that you're getting search results that are a little nutty, go into, the, into there, into the settings page, and click on Manage Search Engines. And it will bring up a list of search engines that it is currently using. Now, here's where you've got to be a little bit careful. Just a little bit. You want to make sure that the search engine you want is highlighted as the default search engine. Once that's done, don't remove it. Because if, you, if you'll notice, if I, if I go up here, um, you want to make the search engine you want default first. And so when I highlight it, you'll see there's no X. Beside it, it's the default engine. You can't remove it if it's default. But look down here, the ask search engine. I can make it default, but I can also remove it. And that's what I want to do, folks. I want ask gone. It gives you nutty results. What is that path, please, then again? OK, the path to this is up uh, for Chrome. Yeah. It's the top right, your three, uh, your uh, settings and then the settings. Strokes. And then, yeah, no, not extensions, under settings. Um, you're going to go down to, uh, let me just uh, get out of this again and I will show you. You're going to manage your search engines. I manage it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we click on that. Now, like I said before, I've got uh, two entries here I don't want, AOL and ask. And just simply by hovering over it, it, it displays the X that you can make that go away. And the same with ask. Is the Bing bar in there too? It is, but I don't mind that so much because the, uh, the results are so close to Yahoo, they're almost the same. Um, the other thing is, is in other search engines, uh, if you do a lot of searching around on different kinds of websites like Wikipedia, you'll find an entry in here for Wikipedia. If you don't like it, make it go away. Uh, Amazon is another one. You do a lot of searches on Amazon for products, you'll find Amazon down there as well. You can make it go away. Do those things slow up your machine? No, no. But uh, these nutty search engines like Ask, they can, they can get in the way of what you really want to do. Because you'll start getting these crazy um, entries for search because it's also searching ask as it's going through it. It's doing Google as the default, but it's also going through ask in the background and saying, what do you got? What do you got? What do you got? It brings them up. All right, so that's, that's that part. Let's... Uh, Yes, I do. Uh, I prefer Chrome over Firefox. Um, I can't update Mozilla anymore. I can't. Yeah. It fails when I try to update yeah. it now on the next feed. Yeah. Uh, you might be able to get a, uh, a good copy of Opera working. Okay, you can try and download Opera and get that to work. Um, Opera operates almost in the same way that, that Chrome does. It's, uh, it's got its settings tab and you go up there and you carefully make changes to the settings that you want. All right, so we've got that out of the way. Uh, deleting your browser history and, and um, cookies. Is Chrome an easy download? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, if, you've, if you've got uh, Internet Explorer 11, 10 or 11, it does it from uh, the Chrome website. It's an installation from the Chrome website, but there is a standalone for Chrome. Uh, it's, I've used it in Windows XP. I've given it to clients to use just because their Internet Explorer has stopped working. Um, is it as good as the, the configured download from Google? No, but it's a way to go. Um, so um, 
we're still on uh, removing the recent history and stuff like that. Um, cookies and all of that. Uh, we've just gone through the uh, settings for Chrome. Okay. And that's for Safari. Okay, checking for adware and malware. Um, in Chrome, these adwares and malwares may very well show up in the extensions as part of the bad stuff that got downloaded. So if you've looked in the extensions and you see stuff you don't like, go looking somewhere else because they may very well be there. And the place to look is in programs and features. You may very well find in programs and features, if you look carefully enough, uh, things from shopping sites, browser helpers and stuff like that they, that have downloaded. Please uninstall them, make them go away. Um, they're of no particular use to you. They are sending information off to you, off to websites that you may not know about. And are they dangerous? Eh, no, they're just a huge pain in the bum. So all those things are extensions on that page? No, no, these are, these are installed programs. Okay. In programs and features, these are installed programs. Um, but in the Chrome browser, if you look in there and you find extensions that you don't, that you didn't know about, then go into programs and features and see if you can find the program that refers to them. Is wherever a time when exe after a name is okay? Like, how do you know when it's not? How do you know when an e and an, when an executable is not okay? Like, One of the things that you can do is you can go to Google search and now you've got the name of the executable carefully spell it because the spelling can be a little funky uh, but carefully spell it into your browser something 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 dot exe and Google will will start giving you entries about that executable program whether it is malware or it's a program that Windows needs to run itself. A lot of times uh, programs with, a, with an obscure name are required by, by Windows to run, to run the computer. And when you start going through this list of stuff, it'll damn soon tell you quickly whether this is malware or whether this is something that Windows requires to run. A little investigation on your part doesn't hurt by using Google. Sometimes when you open a program, or if you get something in the mail and you have to open an attachment, some of them has EXE behind it. Okay, it opening work. attachments from email, unless you know for certain sure that the person that sent you that email wants you to have this executable file and they've told you about it in advance, don't touch it. Okay. Don't touch it. Because... It's never had a negative on it, I just wondered. Yeah, uh, but it can be uh, in a, a very innocuous name. It can be hidden. Uh, the, its, its real purpose can be hidden from you by an innocuous name. It can be a piece of malware with the name setup.exe, okay? Don't touch it unless you know for certain sure that the person that sent you this thing says that it's safe, I've used it, and this is something you should have. So in other words, what you're saying is that it shouldn't have anything. It shouldn't have anything that yeah. exe. Yeah, yeah. If you have an attachment in, a, in an email that's an executable file, please don't touch it. Make it go away. 
you can get more problems than you know what to do with if you play with it. Okay, back to uh, spring cleaning here. Now, the, the next little bit of this is all uh, Norton stuff. I think Norton wrote this wiki article for you. Um, but there are some things that you can do on your own. And um, one of them is to download, install, and run malware bytes. That's one of the best things that you can do if you want to clean up your computer and have it running better than it has for months and months and months because malware bytes will find a good deal of the malware that may be hidden on your computer and it will also remove those entries from the registry. I spell that place for sure. Malware bytes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. One word? Yes. Thank you. Um, for you, there's a video online on how to download and install and use malware bytes. Um, does Fred have your email address? I don't know. Does Fred have your email address? Not yeah, give before you go, make sure Fred has it, and then you can get all of the emails that we've done over the last while. Um, those emails will have video links in them to YouTube. All of these lessons are now videos, so you can go back and look at them again. Thank you. Yes? Back with the Chrome for a minute. I was on Chrome and I was looking up YouTube videos on Windows 10. They're all saying I have to download Adobe Flash. Well, Chrome has a Flash. Yeah. How silly. Do I have so I do? No, if you're using Chrome, if you click on them, they will play. Oh, okay. Yes, oh, they will play. Yeah. Yeah. I got rid of that Adobe Flash. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They will play. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. I, I or they proceed. should. I didn't proceed. I just yeah. saw. Here is um, the next entry that we want to look at is something that is really not required on the modern operating system. And when I say modern, beyond Windows 98 or Windows Millennium neither one of which any of you have, I hope. It's disk defragmenter, defragging. The modern operating system in Windows takes care of all of this stuff in the background of keeping the files organized where Windows 98 could not. Windows XP does a nice job of it. So do you need to defrag your hard drive anymore? If you have OSIS Logic defrag, you don't. take it off. You don't need it. OSLogic? Yeah. No. If you have OSLogic defrag. No. Okay. If Take it off. You don't need it. Defragging a modern hard drive is not required. Okay, so again, um, this tutorial is telling you to go back into programs and features and make sure there are no programs on the computer that you don't know about that got downloaded and installed in the background. Um, it's always good. Now, what's good is, what's a good way to do this is once you've got your computer all cleaned up the way you want it, it's running good. You've got all of these programs deleted from it that you don't want. Sit down, write the programs down as a list. Put it away somewhere and compare that list in six months to what you have now. Okay? And if there's stuff in there that snuck its way in and it will, then you've got your list to compare to. There's no two ways about it. That should not be there. Make it go away. Uninstall it. Now, we're going to talk about backup a little bit. Um, if you buy a big, hard uh, a big thumb drive or a 
large-ish USB hard drive. Um, you can back up all of your important stuff on those drives and I encourage you to do so. You can do it twice a year, you can do it once a month, you can do it every day, whatever floats your boat. But backing up is a good practice. It's a recommended practice. Those important photographs that you've taken over the last 10 years, they can go away in a heartbeat. Maybe a guy like me can get them back. Maybe I can't. But if you've got a backup copy, your heart is not going to sink as far when all of a sudden all your photographs and documents go away or they're corrupted with something. Okay? Believe me, I have seen grown men weeping because their stuff went away. They're important family stuff. They have been weeping. Yes? Is that everything on the internet or just things that are on just, folders in your computer? Just things on folders in your computer that you want to keep. Your pictures, important documents, stuff like that. So you have to go through Well, you can, you, can, um, you can just simply drag the folders to the drive that you've inserted into the computer and it, it won't move them, it just copies them. Okay, so you have a copy. How big of a flash drive do you take to hold everything? Or that would All depend. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 64 gigs is, is a good size. They're, they're a little expensive. But you know what? It's, it's, it's almost the same price to buy a USB hard drive at 500 gigs and pay $70 for it than it is to buy a 64 gig flash drive and pay 55 I think I paid 100 bucks for mine. It's one yeah, terabyte. Yeah, the, the prices have come down on these things. And I've had it a year or more. Yeah, the prices have come down. Uh, 500 gigs is usually good enough, but if that's all you can buy as a terabyte, buy it. Because it's like 10 cents a gig. <laughs> one, a one terabyte hard drive, the cost of the memory on it is 10 cents a gig. Worth buying. Okay. So there you go, um, keeping things backed up. Now, for just a little bit, I want to talk to you about physically cleaning your computer. There have been news stories over the last couple of years, if you sat down and watched CNN, about just how filthy a computer keyboard and mouse really are. <laughs> what, what, you know, deadly diseases are poking around on your keyboard and mouse because everybody uses it and goes <coughs> <laughs> Now that's a smoker's cough, but it could be something else. <coughs> so keeping, keeping your keyboard and mouse a little bit clean, a little bit sanitary, okay, it's a good thing to do. As well as um, if you're prone to sitting at your computer eating your breakfast, um, as my wife is off, want to do, munching away on a muffin and down goes the grubs into the keyboard. Okay, and so I'm in there every month or so with a air can, That's blowing out the keyboard. <laughs> um, so that's something you want to do. Now, how to do it. Please do not spray liquids on a keyboard. Don't do that. Any kind of liquid. Um, if the liquid has ammonia in it, that's a, ammonia I believe is a, is a rather rough base as, as uh, vinegar is a rather rough acid. Delicate electronics don't like these things. So spray it on a cloth and wipe. Do not spray the item and wipe. That's a bad thing. They will fail, especially a laptop keyboard. 
You can clean them with a cloth, a soft cloth, and something that does not have ammonia or an acid. Water's good. A little soapy water is good. Mild soapy. Spray the cloth, rub, rub, rub. That should be good enough. If you want to go to the computer store and buy a can of air and hold the uh, um, a can of compressed air, hold the keyboard up and spray it with the compressed air, that's fine. That's good. That knocks all the crumbs out of it and the dust and stuff. Uh, you can do that. Um, but like I said, these it's an electronic, it's delicate. You've got to be mindful that you can hurt it badly if you go about it too roughly. Can I spray Windex on the screen? I cover the keyboard no. with a towel. No. 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 Spray it on a cloth and use oh. the cloth to wipe. That's what I meant by it. Yeah. Windex. It don't have to be fancy. Um, Windex is a little strong. Here again, make sure it doesn't have any ammonia in it. Ammonia is bad, um, but you can uh, a little bit of a little bit of vinegar on a cloth, like a the less than pickling vinegar, like, which is seven percent. You know, use a five or a four or something like that, mixed in water. That's fine. You can use that as a glass cleaner, right? So that's fine to use. Now. This article talks about taking your computer apart. Good idea. Well, Fred seems to think it's a good idea. I, unless you are, are really adventurous, you have an old computer that you're going to soon get rid of <laughs> and you want to experiment with this. There are plenty of tutorials on the internet in YouTube about how to take a computer box apart and spray it with, uh, with, with a compressed air and get the dust out of it. Yeah. Cat hairs. Yes. Um, no, you can't just vacuum the ins you can and you can't. Um, the inside of the computer box itself, yes, you can vacuum up the cat hair and the dust bunnies that are all sitting around on the bottom, but you really do need compressed air to get the dust out of the important critical areas where it's going to matter. Uh, and the important critical area is around the central processing unit. It's a big unit about like that, usually with a fan on top. And if you look down inside the, the, the cooling fins, it's full of dust. Dust in a computer is like throwing a blanket over it. It can't dissipate its heat. Heat is bad for it. It will fail. So taking the side off your computer and blowing the dust free from the CPU cooling fans, yeah, that might be a good idea once a year or twice a year if, if you've got lots of cats. Um, and like I said, there's plenty of YouTube videos to show you how to do it if you're a little bit adventurous. If not, just keep an eye on the fact that if the, com if, if the holes around the computer, around the power supply, where the power cord goes in, if they're getting really, really dusty, then you can bet a dollar to a hole in a donut. The inside of the computer is really, really dusty and needs to be looked at because the dust is going to cover everything and it will not be able to dissipate heat. Where can you use the compressed air on a laptop? Where can you use the compressed air on a laptop? You can. Um, I, I pretty much can't pick this up right now because it's running, but if you look around carefully on the bottom, you'll find areas where there's perforations, and especially along the sides, there may be perforations. Yes, and along the back, there may be perforations, and if you look carefully through these perforations, you may see what looks like radiator fins. That is the cooling element 
of the computer. Behind those radiator fins is a fan. It is blowing air at the fins, but it's also picking up dust from its surroundings, sending it through the computer, in through this fan, and blasting it at these fins. They catch the dust, they can't cool the computer, the computer quits. Okay, so yes, there are areas on a laptop where you can do this. Now, one little caveat that, that if you're going to do this, even on a laptop or any other computer, if you, wanna, if you want to uh, blow the dust free from, say, the power supply, where the power goes in with a can of air, look down inside of these perforations or screens, and you'll see a fan. Now do this with the computer unplugged, by the way. You'll see a fan in there. Find something to get into those perforations and stop that fan from turning. Because when you blast it with the air, the fan will start to turn. Now that fan is like any other dynamo. If you turn it, it will create voltage. And if that voltage gets away from it and gets into the computer, it can burn it out. So you always want to stop a fan from turning before you take compressed air at it. Just if you can get a pencil in there to stop it from turning, a paper clip or whatever, just to hold that fan still where you're doing that, that's what you want to do. The holes like that on the laptop then? Yes. And if you look carefully, you may very well see fan blades in behind those holes. And you want to take a paper clip, hold them still, and just blast it a little bit. Puff, 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 not <laughs> Puff, yeah. puff, puff. I would have just, 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 just blown the dust back in further. Well, what it, yes, it, it may blow the dust in further, but what you really want to do is get it off of these radiator fins. Now, you may have to keep doing it every couple of months until you can get the computer taken apart by a professional. But uh, get the dust off these radiator fins here again. It's not cooling properly if they're full of dust. All right. Um, okay, let's talk about C Clear. I think I've mentioned before that I'm not a great fan of it. Um, C Cleaner is a registry cleaner. And what it's supposed to do is find all of the, the orphaned entries in the registry that no longer pertain to what is actually running on the computer. If you remove a program, it's supposed to remove all of the registry entries for that program. Sometimes it does not do it completely. Sometimes um, the, the uninstall resource is not saying, okay, go to the registry in this portion of the registry and remove this item. Sometimes it just skips it. So the registry item is still there, but the program is gone. Okay? CCleaner can't take care of that, or it's supposed to. Is there a performance boost if you use it? I've never seen anything more in the literature that I've read of a really aggressive registry cleanup might get you two tenths of a second better on a boot up. Two tenths of a second. Okay. So. Can I ask a question on the, on the latest version of uh, C Clean that I use? It. And it, when the window comes up, it says uh, it can, it will remove files from the programs and files. Yes. It doesn't pick up anything that it isn't supposed to. Therein lies the problem. If you get a false positive in CCleaner that CCleaner doesn't like this and it's going to make it go away, if you get a false positive and it makes something go away that the computer still needs, you've made a brick. The computer may not run or it may not run properly, or it may give you errors. That's one of the reasons why I don't like registry cleaners. If they are really, really aggressive, they can make mistakes. I think 
if they are really, really um, uh, less aggressive, and, and what good are they doing if they're not getting in there and finding everything? So. They don't tell you what they removed. No, it just says removed seven programs. Uh, yeah, exactly. Or, or seven, in, maybe not programs, but entries. Entries, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, Registry yeah. entries. Okay, yeah. and like I said, if it makes a mistake and it takes something out that the computer needs, now you've got errors on boot up because the registry is, is looking for a program and the registry entry is not there. Is so, yes, you can, if you make that, pro, if you make that, a system restore um, can help you, um, but then you're back to, you've restored your computer back to a place where um, you had problems. So you've got to redo everything you did, but not do the last thing you did that made the biggest problem. I've never had a problem. Yeah, well if you've never had a problem with it, you are lucky, lucky, lucky. Maybe I, what, yeah. Yeah, if, if you've not have, had a problem, uh, good for you, but I see these things in my work where CCleaner has done damage. So I, uh, I haven't done a problem on this, so obviously it's not doing anything, and basically is what I'm saying. Well, is it being too aggressive? No. Is it not being aggressive enough? Who knows? Who knows? Is there something better than CCleaner? Um, that actually works? <laughs> There is something better, and I use it because I know what I'm doing. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch it. Yeah, don't even tell us. <laughs> um, usually, uninstall program or uninstallers are uh, sort of a mirror image of the installer that put the program in, only it does everything in reverse. It's supposed to. It's supposed to know that a registry entry was written here. We'll go back to that registry entry and unwrite it or change it back to what it should be. A lot of times, a lazy programmer will jump over things that should be done when uninstalling a program. And so things get left behind. There are uninstallers that will go through the registry and go through the program folders and find these entries and allow you to manually remove them. However, if you don't know what you're doing, you could, you, it's possible, number one, that you'll miss something, and number two, that you will do a false positive and remove something the computer needs. For a fellow like me who's done it for a long time, I understand where, what these registry entries are required for. So I know when to take them out and leave them. And if I don't know, the default is leave it. Do some of these things that are left in become malware? No, no. They, they, here again, they're, as your computer is booting up, it's going through the registry looking at the entries in it. And, you know, if, if there's thousands and thousands and thousands of registry entries, and there are something over 5,000 registry entries, and it goes through every one of them and says, okay, uh, this registry entry says start this program on boot up. Um, load this program in the background. Have this program available, but stop it from running. These are registry entries. It also, entries tell you where every icon is located on your desktop. Exact position. That's a registry entry. If you moved it yesterday, it will show up back there today when you boot again. That's a registry entry. So this is how the computer keeps track of what you've done. Okay. Is the registry key the same thing? There are four, 
uh, there are four types of registry keys and as a large bundle. Um, and every one of them has sub keys. And every one of those has sub keys. And every one of those has sub keys. You can go 15 clicks deep in a registry entry that must be there. If it's not there, the computer's a brick. So you can go 15 clicks deep to find one. Okay? That's why I do not recommend you mess with it. <laughs> okay, so we're just about done here. This is physical cleaning. Um, I, I've let you know what you can and cannot do. And cleaning up a keyboard and, and a laptop, making it look pretty again. Mild soap with a clean cloth. Take your time, a little rub, rub, rub. Rub, 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 let it dry. Do not, do not spray it with anything. Okay? This is all, right? Yo. <laughs> <laughs> a little bad. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. No, you can. Okay. This has got nothing to do with what you're saying. How do I find the Hotmail sign in page? My, my friend came over and she says, Can I sign in? We couldn't find the page. There is, there is no Hotmail sign-in page you want to go to Outlook.com. Oh, we were. Yeah. And you know what? I got a big red X on the screen and I went, turn it off. Yep. Yeah. 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 Hotmail is now Outlook. That's Computer Club lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.